This novel was possible because of a Patreon member request. So if you want to support this channel you can consider becoming a Patreon member to make the request like this. Or you can support this channel on PayPal or Ko-fi link in the description. And if you want to buy Google Drive link which has more than 300 plus novel audiobook then you can visit my Ko-fi account. Where you will get Google Drive link in just $20 for lifetime. And if you want to support the author credit link will be in video discretion. Chapter 31, see 31 time skip. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 46. I'll be writing two more chapters today. Get on Discord. Dash one month later. After completing his first mission from S.H.I.E.L.D., Peter was offered multiple missions a week from then on. Upon learning that Peter could complete missions within an hour or two, depending on the difficulty and tediousness, S.H.I.E.L.D. started offloading jobs onto their newest contractor at a higher rate than they originally planned. Of course, they now knew that Peter had some sort of teleportation ability or perhaps a frightening movement speed. Though S.H.I.E.L.D. could do nothing but mark it down in their list of Spider-Man's powers. Fury couldn't even investigate to learn what it was, as they could do nothing that Peter wouldn't pick up with his senses. Even his online presence and contact information brought back nothing they could use. Most of the missions that S.H.I.E.L.D. brought to Peter were accepted, as they seemed to be taking his morals into account. He didn't receive any assassination missions or anything that could ruin someone else's life that didn't deserve it. Most missions were either spying, collecting information, or some sort of rescue type mission, which Peter would always accept. So far, the only time he has declined a mission was when he was busy and it wouldn't risk someone's life if he didn't do it. It goes without saying that all of his missions have a 100% success rate. With his super and magical powers, it was all too easy to rescue someone from a prison or steal some information. He started making a name for himself in the spy community as well. They started calling him Ghost, as he never appears on camera and nobody has an accurate description of what he looks like. Only S.H.I.E.L.D. knows that it's Spider-Man completing these missions. Other than the new missions he started going on, everything was normal in Peter's life. Well, normal for Spider-Man. Candy Crush has risen to a player base of almost 1 million, and is now bringing in a whopping 3 million dollars a month. All of which came from the in-game shop, as the game itself is free. Peter has begun to notice many of his classmates playing the game as well, which is a good sign for Candy Crush's coming growth. As for social media, Spider-Man's presence there only grows with every passing day. YouTube, 287,560,154. Twitter, 187,069,030. Instagram, 213,722,009. May finally talked him into going on some talk shows, which was an idea he wasn't a fan of, but she was really excited about it. Peter decided to just do it to make her happy. Spider-Man made appearances on the Oprah Winfrey show alongside a few news stations. The news stations asked fairly tame questions, while Oprah was more of a drama baiter than Peter expected. Flashback. Now that we've broken the ice with a few questions, I want to ask something a bit juicier. Do you mind? Oprah asks for permission. She didn't want to upset someone with superpowers after all. Sure, I may refuse to answer though. Peter nods from his seat across from her. Why does J. Jonah Jameson have a problem with you? Oprah asks. Sigh, do you want the real answer or the nice one? Peter asks back. Both. Let's start with the nice one. She answers. Jonah is a man that's very critical of everything he sees and hears about. Peter says as if he's working overtime to say something nice. And the real answer. Oprah leans forward in her chair as she asks. Ratings. Peter answers with a shrug. It's the same reason you had those weird guests on your show before cementing yourself as who you are today. People want to hear about something crazy and interesting. Jonah simply lies and creates these huge scandals or theories. Sadly, a percentage of his viewers believe him. Oh Jesus, don't bring up those dark times. Oprah says as she hides her face. Well, my mother was a fan of those times. Peter says, referring to his Aunt May as he didn't want to give out too much info. She especially found that one episode with the cheating midget couple to be hilarious. Oh God, the mailman. She mutters in agony as the studio audience starts laughing. After that, Oprah asks some personal questions. Though Peter didn't answer about half of them, but one question certainly broke the hearts of many fans around the world. Are you currently in a relationship? She asked, getting everyone in the crowd's attention instantly. Is there a Mrs. Spider-Man? Yes, but I can't say her name. Peter answers and sees some disappointed faces in the crowd. Does she know you're Spider-Man? Yes, I actually revealed. The interview continued and soon came to an end, but before leaving, Peter got Oprah to sign something for May. She was a fan after all. After that show, J. Jonah Jameson went on a week-long angry rant about Spider-Man. His show was nothing but yelling while his Twitter feed was nothing but capital letters, long paragraphs, and exclamation points. When Peter returned home after the interview, May ran up to him and pulled Peter into a warm hug. Oprah's show isn't usually a live thing like the news, but since Spider-Man was involved they aired it live that day. May watched it all and heard Peter refer to her as his mother. He's only done that when he was a child and it was by accident. Hearing him genuinely refer to her as such warmed May's heart and brought tears to her eyes. Whether he did it to hide information or not didn't matter to her. What's this about? Peter asked as he didn't understand why he was hugged. Nothing. 
Mei didn't reveal anything. I just love you so much. I love you too, Mei. Flashback end. MJ also saw him mention some small things about their relationship, which she was certainly embarrassed and happy about at the same time. Embarrassed because she didn't expect to be talked about on live TV, and happy because Spider-Man's more thirsty fans would hopefully stop pursuing him. That's right, one of the downfalls of starting his social media accounts was thirsty fans. There are an uncountable amount of nudes in his DMs, which Peter has shown to MJ as he didn't want her to find out and misunderstand later on. Though that's not all, as Spider-Man has entire groups of people, regardless of gender, that constantly speak out online about wanting to date him and what it would be like. It's a crazy world out there. Peter's magical training has also taken a step in a new direction. He has started learning to mold eldritch energy into weapons, which is an easy skill to pick up, but hard to master. On the first day of practice, Peter easily made an eldritch whip and tau mandalas. The whip was infinitely easier to produce than the tau mandalas, but that was only because of the intricate patterns on the dual shields. Once Peter got the patterns of the tau mandalas down, he could create the shields at the drop of a hat. The harder part began with taking a step ahead of those two weapons. Eldritch energy is a fairly malleable energy, so with practice, anything could be made from it. Peter just had to practice the specific weapon and he could master forming it with enough time. The only reason that the whip and tau mandalas are easier to learn is simple. The whip is nothing but a noodle of eldritch energy, while the tau mandalas are similar to a spell circle, which Peter has had tons of practice with up until now. In the past month, Peter has mastered three weapons, not including the whip and dual shields. He can currently make a huge warhammer, brass knuckles, and a simple baseball bat. Peter is currently working on forming a throwing spear, though he would master that quickly, as it's not a very complicated weapon. As for Peter's personal life, everything seems to be going perfectly. He and MJ have been together for more than two months, without much issue. They haven't had a real argument in their relationship yet, though it would happen sooner or later. Every relationship has them, no matter which kind. The most they've ever argued about up until now is Peter not giving her enough free gold in Candy Crush, as MJ is addicted to that game, or Peter being overly affectionate in public. Though, these arguments are carried out jokingly and he thinks that MJ may like small shows of public affection more than she lets on. All in all, they've had a very happy and drama-free relationship. There was a point semi-recently, where MJ asked Peter if she was his girlfriend, which he laughed at immediately. Flashback. Don't laugh. MJ exclaimed in embarrassment. I'm sorry, I just didn't expect that. Peter says as he pulls her in close. I thought we were on the same page. Well, I think we are but I want you to say it without joking. MJ says as she looks into Peter's eyes. Of course, you're my girlfriend. Peter says as he pecks her on the lips. Good. MJ muttered as she grabbed the back of Peter's head and pulled him into a much longer and more intimate kiss. Flashback end. While Peter was uploading his last video of the month, his phone went off and a text from Natasha appeared. Natasha, meet at the warehouse. New mission. Time sensitive. A slash n, 1594 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll make Ned into a giga chad and hook him up with Natasha or someone. Chapter 32, C32 Iron Man arrives. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 47. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. Outside of a cave, deep in the desert of Afghanistan, an iron robot fires flames from its hands, burning everyone and everything in the vicinity. Insert picture of MCU original Iron Man suit. Armed men and women, alongside tons of crates filled with Stark Industries weaponry and explosives were catching fire at an alarming rate. The people surrounding the walking metal man fired bullet after bullet, yet not a single projectile could penetrate its thick iron shell. Soon enough, the spreading fire burned through the explosive crates, causing explosions to go off one by one. Boom bang boom bang. Tapping a button on its wrist, the metal robot shoots into the air merely seconds before a large mushroom cloud explosion happens, killing everyone in the area. Shooting out of the top of that mushroom cloud, the robot soars through the air before slowly losing altitude and crashing into a sandy hill, which definitely softened the impact. As the sand cleared, metal was strewn about everywhere, and inside the center of that mess was Tony Stark. Pieces of what was thought to be a robot were still attached to him like an advanced type of metal armor. Inhale exhale. Tony breathes heavily as he just lays in the mess of sand and metal parts, catching his breath with a tired and worn out look on his face. He's gone through hell for the past three months. First, he was kidnapped by terrorists armed with his own weaponry. Then he found out that he had shrapnel moving toward his heart, which was somehow stopped by a magnet that was attached to a car battery. After all of that, Tony was forced to make a Jericho missile for his captors alongside his new friend Yinsen, who died just as they were going to escape together with the metal suit, which they built in secret. Now, Tony just finished slaughtering dozens of people and is currently stuck in the middle of the desert with an arc reactor he built in a cave out of scraps stuck to his chest. I hate the desert. Tony mutters as he starts to move a bit, checking his body for injuries. Suddenly, a golden wisp of light appears in the middle of the air, catching Tony's attention out of the corner of his eye. What the? Tony mutters as the wisp of golden light extends into a large circle. Is this a mirage? Your mission is time sensitive. Natasha hands over a folder as Peter walked into the warehouse. Is it another rescue? 
Peter asks as he opens the folder and instantly sees a satellite picture of the original Iron Man suit, standing outside of a cave in the desert. What's this? It's Tony Stark. He's making his escape from a terrorist group known as the Ten Rings. Natasha gives a brief overview as Peter looks through the pictures, seeing the large explosion that soon filled the area and the spot where Tony landed soon after. Our satellites are out of range now, but he should still be in that location. We need you to pick him up. Peter was beyond excited. This is the best first meeting he could ask for, as Peter already planned to make contact with Tony Stark soon after his return. All right, I've always wanted to meet Tony Stark anyway. Peter shrugs and walks towards the exit. Get some medics in here. I'll be back in a few minutes. As the circle forms in front of Tony Stark's unbelieving eyes, an image appears in the center and Spider-Man steps through, setting foot on the uneven sands of Afghanistan. Yo. Peter waves as the portal behind him closes. Did I hit my head on the landing? Tony mutters as he inspects his head with his hands, looking for any bumps, dents, and slash or blood. Yeah, sure I'm your imaginary friend. Peter jokes as he walks over and pulls Tony up to his feet. Holy sh asterisk t. Tony exclaims as he feels Peter pull him upwards. You're real. Well, yeah. Peter answers with a nod, enjoying this whole situation a bit too much. How did you do that? Tony says, pointing to where the portal used to be. I mean, it's, it's, magic. Peter tries to finish his sentence. Impossible. Tony disregards Peter's answer and gives his own. Everything is impossible until you figure out how to do it. Peter shrugs. Okay, so how did you do it? Is it some sort of a quantum physics, dark matter, wormholes, or what? Tony asks, completely forgetting he's stuck in a desert. How about I show you later? Just keep this to yourself and I'll take you home. Deal. Peter offers. Deal. Tony instantly accepts. All right, follow me. Peter says as he waves his hand, creating another portal. Tony's mind broke at that moment. Making a portal is theoretically possible with the right technology, but Spider-Man didn't seem to have any sort of tech with him. Come on. Peter says, pushing Tony through the portal. Ack. Tony grunts as he falls through the portal and into the warehouse, where Peter received this mission. Standing in front of them is Natasha, who just called in for medics and was waiting to hear back from Peter. She was shocked that Peter would so easily reveal the form of transportation he's been hiding until now. Don't think I don't know about your little lie. If you're going to learn about it from satellite images, then I might as well show you. Peter says as he lifts Tony off the floor and sets him on his feet. Aye aye. Natasha didn't know what to say. She was told by S.H.I.E.L.D. that the satellites were out of range before giving Peter the mission, but that doesn't mean she didn't know it was a lie from the start. Natasha is an expert in lies and deception, so she knew that Fury was lying to her. Fury wasn't sure that Natasha would betray Peter, as they'd spent a lot of time together and he wasn't her average victim. She's used to betraying foreign dignitaries, spies, nobles, politicians, and just all-around bad people. Not kind-hearted superheroes. Fury simply decided for her and told the lie himself. He wanted to use this moment to get pictures of how Spider-Man gets around. It was the perfect moment that S.H.I.E.L.D. was waiting for. Peter always accepts rescue missions, and thankfully, this one was urgent and in a wide open desert, where he couldn't hide his portal. Natasha felt bad for not warning Peter but she had to as it's her job. Though that doesn't stop the horrible feeling of betraying someone you spent months teaching and befriending from rearing its ugly head. Though she's used to that feeling and it would ease soon enough. Is this some sort of couple's spat? Tony asks jokingly, trying his best to shoo away the bad atmosphere. No, just a friendly one. Peter comments as he turns to Tony. Are you hurt anywhere? Medics should be here soon. I'm definitely bruised and scraped up, but other than that I'm fine. Tony says as he knocks on his arc reactor. This thing is keeping me alive. How is it doing that? Natasha asks. It's powering a magnet underneath that's holding back shrapnel from entering my heart. Tony says proudly. Wow, is that a mini arc reactor? Like the big one your dad made to power Stark Industries headquarters. Peter pretends to figure it out. Yes, are you a fan or something? Tony asks hopefully. He wanted the man that can make portals with his mind to be his or his father's fan. That way he would be more willing to teach him how it's done. Not really, I'm just a bit of a nerd. Peter shrugs uncaringly. Deep inside, Peter is a bit of a fanboy for Tony Stark, just like everyone else in his past life, but he wouldn't reveal that to the man himself. Soon enough, medics came rolling in and gave Tony a thorough checkup, which he hated every second of. Once it was finally finished, Tony stood up and walked to the exit. The medics actually wanted him to go to a hospital, but Tony refused. Where are you going? Natasha asks. I need some good old-fashioned American fast food. Tony announces grandly with his arms wide open. Cheeseburgers, french fries, chicken nuggets, milkshakes. I want it all. Wait here and I'll bring a car around for you. Natasha catches up to Tony and blocks the doorway. You can't just walk around New York City like this. You've been missing for three months. People will swarm like locusts. So that's where we are? Fine, but hurry up. Tony says hurriedly. I've eaten nothing but scraps for too long and I'm starving. Without a word, Natasha walks off to get a car. Peter wasn't sure if she had a car, as he's never seen one before. Is she going to steal one? Peter thought as Tony turns to him. Are you tagging along, Webhead? Tony asks. Webhead. Peter asks back. Yeah, you like it. Sure, it's actually the name of my Gmail account. 
A slash N, 1539 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll gamble it all away on stake.com. I heckin' love Gamba. Chapter 33, C33 Superhero Team Up. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 14 chapters ahead at chapter 47. Took the day off yesterday but I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. Sitting in a black four-door SUV, Natasha drives Peter and Tony to a nearby McDonald's. While they drove, many people caught a glimpse of Spider-Man in the back seat, but that wasn't all they saw. Sitting in the front seat was Tony Stark, the man that's been missing for three months and was long thought to be deceased by this point in time. Short and blurry videos and pictures were posted on social media, causing millions of people around the world to wonder if this was a hoax or not. Peter's ghost phone was blowing up with notifications, everyone wanted to know if the videos were real or not. Can't you mute that thing? Tony asks as he shoves a wad of salty McDonald's fries into his mouth. Sorry, Twitter is freaking out about us. Some people we passed earlier must have taken pictures or videos. Peter says as he muted his phone. Twitter. Tony mutters after slurping on a chocolate milkshake. Spider-Man has a Twitter account. He has even been on the Oprah Winfrey show. Natasha says, rolling her eyes at Peter through the rearview mirror. Oprah? I haven't even been on Oprah. Tony says incredulously. I guess you're just not as famous as me. Peter says, knowing he's provoking Tony's ego. Tony stopped eating and turned towards Peter. It's on. What's on? Peter asked questioningly. I think he took that as a challenge. Natasha clarifies and Tony nods his head alongside her. Well, good luck. Peter says as he whips out his phone and shows Tony his follower and subscriber counts. Holy sh asterisk t. Tony exclaims as he reads numbers in the hundreds of millions. Like I said, good luck. After Tony finished eating, he borrowed Natasha's phone and made a few phone calls. Soon enough, a black tinted car arrived to pick him up. I have some business to take care of. Tony says as he turns to Peter. You want to tag along, webhead? No, I have to get home. Peter refuses with a shake of his head. Though, I'll come to visit you. Are you returning to Los Angeles? Yeah, I have to get back to the company headquarters. Tony nods. All right, I'll visit you tomorrow. Peter says as he shoots a web at a nearby building and tugs, launching off into the distance. I was hoping he would give me a lift home. Tony sighs dejectedly as he waves at Natasha and hops into the car, leaving her there. Ring ring ring. Romanoff. Natasha answers the phone. We got the images back, he's using. Fury says but Natasha stops him. Portals, I know. She says with a bit of sass in her voice. He showed it to you. Fury asks. Yes, he knew it was a lie from the start and seems to be upset with me now. Natasha says with a sigh. Should we pull you out and send a different agent to take your place? Fury asks, not affected a single bit by the outcome of his lie. No, I'll figure it out. Natasha answers with a tired sigh. All right, I'll have Barton on standby just in case. Spider-Man is too good of an asset to lose after all. Fury says and cuts the call. Putting the phone away, Natasha leans up against her stolen car with a sad and conflicted look on her face. She needed to apologize and make it up to Spy Day somehow. The next day, MJ came over after school and they watched TV together in the living room. May was at work and Ned has been working on his game for Parker Games, so they had the house all to themselves. Just as things were getting a bit hot and heavy, the random channel they had on suddenly changed to a live press conference. Hey, would it be alright if everyone sat down? A voice came from the TV. Peter's attention was immediately drawn away from MJ's lips and onto the TV, where they both saw Tony Stark sitting in front of a podium. Why don't you just sit down? That way you can see me, and this is a bit less formal. Tony says to the crowd on the other side of the camera. Good to see you. Tony says to Obadiah Stana, who is standing there beside him. Insert picture of MCU Obadiah Stana here. Good to see you too. Stana responds with nothing but lies. Didn't you just rescue him? Why is he holding a press conference? MJ asks, from her position wrapped in Peter's arms. I don't know. Peter says as they both watch curiously. I never got to say goodbye to my father. There are questions that I would have asked him. I would have asked him how he felt about what this company did. If he was conflicted, if he ever had doubts. Or maybe he was every inch the man we all remember from the newsreels. I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend and protect them. I saw that I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. Tony says with a hollow look in his eyes. What happened over there? One of the reporters in the crowd asks. I had my eyes opened. Tony stands and moves behind the podium. I came to realize that I have more to offer this world than just making things that blow up. That is why, effective immediately, I am shutting down the weapons manufacturing division of Stark International. A huge commotion is heard, as every reporter in the room starts rapid-firing questions. Until such a time as I can decide what the future of the company will be, what direction it should take, hopefully, one that I'm comfortable with and is consistent with the highest good for this country, as well. Tony leaves the stage and Obadiah Stana takes his place at the podium. What we should take away from this is that Tony's back, and he's healthier than ever. We're going to have a... Stana speaks and Peter mutes the TV. How did a bunch of terrorists get a hold of Stark weapons? MJ asks suspiciously. It sounds like someone in his company is selling some goods off the books. Peter answers. 
Are you still planning to visit Stark today? MJ asks as she pulled out of Peter's hold and stood up. Yeah, where are you going? Peter confirms. Home, go visit Tony and get the details. Maybe you can help. MJ says as she pecks Peter on the cheek and makes her way to the door. Be sure to bring me back all the details. At that moment, Peter knew why she was doing this. MJ wanted the juicy details about what she just heard on TV. Luckily, her significant other has some connections. She would make a good reporter or detective. Stepping through a portal into the Stark Mansion in Los Angeles, Peter enters Tony's workshop and sees Pepper Potts standing over Tony, who is shirtless on a reclined chair. There's a hole in his chest and the arc reactor is on a nearby table. Pepper's fingers are all up inside Tony's chest hole, reaching for something. Insert picture of MCU Pepper Potts here. Okay, now make sure that when you pull it out, that you don't. Tony tries to explain something, but Pepper pulls out a wire with a magnet attached causing some nearby medical equipment to start beeping. There's a magnet at the end of it? That was it. You just pulled it out. Oh, God. Pepper starts to panic. Okay, I was not expecting that. Tony mutters. Okay, what do I do? Pepper asks as she tries to put the magnet back inside Tony's chest hole. Don't put it back in? Don't put it back in. Tony stops her. What's wrong? Pepper asks. Nothing, I'm just going into cardiac arrest. Tony says. Can I lend a hand? Peter makes his presence known, scaring Pepper with his sudden appearance. A-H-H. Webhead. Perfect timing. Tony says as he waves Peter over. You say you're a nerd, right? Help me out. Pepper immediately steps away in shock as Spider-Man takes her place and begins fixing whatever she did. Tony walks him through it and in no time a brand new magnet and arc reactor are in place. Oh, that's so much better. Tony says as the shrapnel in his chest is no longer making its way towards his heart. Thanks, webhead. I owe you one. You owe me two. Peter holds up two fingers. I also saved you from a desert. Sir, if this is a good time, I believe I require a diagnostics check. The cameras seem to be malfunctioning. Jarvis speaks through the speakers in the room. How so? Tony asks as he rolls his chair toward a nearby computer. You are talking to somebody that I can't see. I can hear his voice through the microphones in the house, yet he's invisible to the cameras. Jarvis explains. Oh, sorry. Let me fix that for you. Peter says and turns off his camera protection. Instantly, Tony saw Spider-Man appear on a nearby surveillance monitor, and Jarvis could see him as clear as day. That's a neat bit of technology. Tony nods in approval. It's not. Peter answers cryptically as he turns to a very confused Pepper Potts. Hello, I'm Spider-Man sorry for the late introduction. Peter says as he holds his hand forward. P. Pepper. She says and shakes Peter's hand. Sorry for dropping in without permission, but I saw the press conference and thought I'd come over. Well, that's only half truthful. My girlfriend was watching too and wanted to know how those terrorists got your weapons. Though I have to say, I'm curious as well. Peter says as he turns back to Tony. I haven't had time to look into it yet. Want to team up and figure it out, webhead. Tony asks excitedly. It'll be like a comic book team up. Except you aren't a superhero. Peter says and Tony's eyes brighten as if a light bulb went off in his head. I could be. Tony mutters lowly. Only Peter could hear what Tony said, and a smile instantly formed on his face. Did I just help Tony Stark decide to officially become Iron Man? A slash N, 1743 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll do nothing because I'm lazy. Sleeping face. Chapter 34, C34 Mark 2. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 49. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. So, what do you say? Want to stick around and help me out? Tony asks. Sure. Peter agrees with a shrug. Just keep my being here to yourselves. I don't need fans or vengeful criminals coming to your house. Ah, I wanted to post a selfie of us on my new Twitter account. Tony whines. You made a Twitter account. Pepper asks in surprise. He's trying to compete with me. Peter reveals. In what? Pepper asks. Being famous. Tony says as he holds up his phone. See, I already have over 300,000 followers. Really? Pepper was not amused. Yeah, I pretty much told him it would be impossible. Peter comments. Soon enough, Pepper left with the old arc reactor in hand. Tony told her to incinerate it, but Peter knows that she wouldn't. She's too sentimental for that. So, should we start hacking into your company? Peter asks, but Tony shakes his head. Jarvis is already on that. We have something else to work on. Jarvis, open the project file named Mark II. Tony says, and the monitors in the workshop change to show schematics and blueprints for the Mark II Iron Man suit. In the center of the room, a hologram appears, showing a brief outline of the whole suit. You're making another suit? The other one didn't last very long before it fell apart. Peter comments as he looks over the monitors. Well, that was built in a cave out of scraps. Tony rolls his eyes. This one will be built with the best technology available. Are you trying to take over my job? Peter asks. What? Not enough room in the world for two superheroes. Tony raises an eyebrow at him. I wouldn't say that. Peter says as he looks straight at Tony. As long as you admit that I'm your senpai and become my sidekick, then I have no problem taking you under my wing. That's never going to happen. Tony refuses adamantly. 
You're no fun, Peter says as he goes back to observing the monitors. Why do you want to make this thing anyway? Do you really want to be a hero? The way I see it is that this solves two major problems. The people that kidnapped me dash Tony says as he types on his keyboard, pulling up images and videos of the Ten Rings. I didn't kill them all. More of my weapons could be out there. I need to stop them. Every person they kill is blood on my hands. I won't allow that. And the other reason. Peter asks. I have a lot to make up for. Who knows how many lives my creations have ruined. I don't trust the government or even my own company to do the right thing anymore, so I'll do it myself. Tony explains. All right, I'm on board. Peter starts getting excited. Though, you'll need a superhero name. How about Metal Man? Tony throws out an idea. No, that's Lame. Let's just get this thing built first. Maybe the media can come up with a better name. While Peter and Tony start working on the new Iron Man suit, men from the Ten Rings were searching the desert for the left-behind parts of the Iron Man Mark I suit. A man with half of his face burned badly bends down and picks up a piece of metal. Sand falls through some holes in the metal piece, revealing it to be the broken-off face mask of the Iron Man Mark I suit. Insert picture of MCU Rasa from the Ten Rings. Time passes as Tony and Peter work throughout the week to get the Iron Man suit built. They started with the boots, which were finished by the second day. Testing them was a huge mess as Tony was launched into the ceiling, nearing breaking all of the bones in his body. On day three, they began working on the hand repulsors, for stabilization during flight. While Peter was strapping the repulsor to Tony's right hand, Pepper came down to the workshop. Obadiah is upstairs waiting for you, Mr. Stark. She says as Tony activates the arm repulsor, launching himself backward and onto the ground. Oh my god, are you okay? Eh, hey, he's fine. Peter says with a shrug. This isn't the first time. Yay, I'm good. Tony grunts as he wobbly stands back up. While Tony went to go and speak with Ironmonger, the man who would soon betray him for a second time, Peter watched the whole scene from the workshop's monitors, thanks to Jarvis. Obadiah revealed that the board of Tony's company is filing an injunction against him, while also trying to get Tony to hand over the arc reactor for testing, which he immediately refused. When Tony came back, he had two slices of pizza in hand. Want some? He asks as he stuffs his face. No, that pizza is a disgrace to New York's standards. Peter declines jokingly as he decides to drop a hint. Is it just me or does that Stan Egg guy seem creepy and suspicious? What Obi? He's just like that. Tony shrugs and they get back to work. Peter knew that Tony wouldn't believe him. Obadiah Stana is practically family to Tony. Nothing but cold hard proof would sway Tony's loyalty to the man, so Peter wouldn't push it. Planting a small seed of doubt was enough. After getting the feet and hands of the suit finished, Peter and Tony connected everything and launched their first test flight. Due to the constant injuries that Tony has been receiving, Peter webbed up the surrounding area as a sort of safety net. I feel like I'm a bug that's about to get eaten by a huge spider. Tony says as he looks up at all the web. It's either this or some broken bones and a concussion. Now, kick that baby into gear and start flying. Peter says, stepping back to give Tony some room. Here it goes. Tony says nervously as he activated the boots and gloves. Within seconds, Tony was pushed off the ground and shakily began hovering in place. After getting used to the balance of flying, Tony did a small lap around the room and landed on his feet, and was only slightly out of balance. Yes. Tony celebrates as he catches his balance. It worked, but now we have to tweak and upgrade it. Let's not forget the heads-up display and armor too. Peter says, instantly bringing Tony back to work mode. The armor will be built with machines controlled by Jarvis, so all we have to do is build and code the HUD. After that, Jarvis will put everything together for us. Tony explains. Man, I need my own AI. Peter mutters, causing Tony to start bragging about Jarvis. A week later and everything was put together, marking the completion of the Iron Man Mark II suit. With the help of Tony's many robots, the man himself donned the silver suit and started testing the HUD with Jarvis. Insert picture of silver Mark II Iron Man suit here. Everything working. Peter asks from the sidelines. Everything seems good. Tony says in a slightly morphed metallic voice, as the suit's helmet is closed. Without a word, Tony starts hovering off the ground and leans forward, shooting out of the workshop's garage entrance. This idiot. Peter mutters as he walks over to the monitors. Jarvis, give me a visual on our resident dumb asterisk SS. Yes, sir. He responds and a view from Tony's helmet appears on the main screen. Whoa whoa. Tony yelled as he soars through the air. He was shaky at first but soon started to fly around like a skilled pilot. Getting a bit ballsy, Tony turns and launches himself up into the sky, though, maybe a bit too high, as the metal suit begins to freeze due to the high altitude. Suddenly, the suit loses power, and Tony begins falling from the sky. Ack. He yelled as the ground became closer and closer. Shaking his head, Peter opened a portal onto the floor. As soon as the portal opened, the visual on the monitor showed a similar portal open up under Tony, swallowing him. Ack. Tony's screams fill the workshop as he comes shooting up out of the portal on the floor. Smacking into the ceiling, some ice breaks off of the suit as Tony bounces back onto one of his many expensive cars, completely totaling it. As the alarm of the crushed car fills the room, a nearby robot shoots a fire extinguisher onto Tony, who is still getting over his near-death experience. Well, that was dumb. 
Peter comments as he walks over and pulls up the face mask, revealing Tony's face. Yeah, not the smartest thing I've done. Once the suit was removed and Tony was checked for injuries, Jarvis was instructed to create another suit. Though this one wouldn't be affected by the cold as the Mark II was. Of course, the bright red and gold color scheme would be added this time as well. While Peter and Tony were hanging out and waiting for the suit to be finished, they heard something interesting on the news. Tonight's red hot red carpet is right here at the Disney Concert Hall, where Tony Stark's third annual benefit for the Firefighters Family Fund has become the place to be for L.A.S. High Society. Looks like you weren't invited to your own event. Peter comments. Looking at the TV, Tony saw Obadiah Stana walking into the event hall with a smile on his face. Instantly, he remembered what Peter said. Creepy and suspicious, huh? Tony thought as he turned to Peter. Want to crash a party? A slash N, 1630 words. Don't forget my stones. Or I'll cry since we were number one in the Power Stone ranking the last time I checked. You don't want me to cry do you? Crying face chapter 35, see 35 Tony's realization. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 50. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. A million dollar black two-door supercar pulls up in front of a crowded red carpet entrance. The spotless red carpet was flanked on both sides by a plethora of reporters and cameramen. The building itself was an intricate events hall, which probably cost a pretty penny to rent for the charity event. I can't believe I agreed to this. Peter mutters from the passenger seat, still dressed in his spider suit. How did you talk me into this again? Let's go. It's too late to turn back now. Tony smirks and exits the car, drawing all the attention and cameras their way. As a valet takes his keys, Peter sighs and opens the passenger side door, stepping out as well. Instantly, the crowd begins to freak out, as no one expected Spider-Man to attend this event, let alone for him to be outside of New York, especially alongside the controversial Tony Stark. Putting his arm over Peter's shoulder, Tony walks Peter down the red carpet with a beaming smile on his face. He was loving this. That's Spider-Man. Is this a joke? How does Stark know Spider-Man? The crowd had nothing but questions as Tony and Peter walked up to Obadiah Stana, who was in the middle of some sort of interview on the red carpet. Along the way, Peter saw Stanley dressed as Hugh Hefner. Stanley winked at Peter before walking into the crowd with a woman on each arm, disappearing from Peter's senses completely. Is he the god of this world or something? Peter thought as he remembered all of Stan Lee's cameos. Weapons manufacturing is only one small part of what Stark Industries is all about, and our partnership with the fire and rescue community. Stan S speaks to a reporter. What's the world coming to when a guy has to crash his own party? Tony surprises Stan S, who turns around quickly. Though that surprise morphed into shock as he saw Spider-Man standing next to Tony. He couldn't believe his eyes. Ah. Tony, is that Spider-Man? Stan A asks nervously. He instantly thought that Spider-Man may be suspicious of him. After all, he's funding a terrorist organization, which would make him a criminal in Spider-Man's book. Yep, me and Webhead here are pals. We'll see you inside, Obi. Tony says as he keeps walks alongside Peter. Leaving a bewildered and worried Obadiah Stan A behind, Peter and Tony walk through a sea of camera flashes to get inside. This was your plan all along, wasn't it? Peter asks. I don't know what you mean. Tony acts innocent. Those pictures of us together are going to bring you millions of followers. You're still trying to outdo me, aren't you? Peter put it all together. Hey, thanks for the followers. Tony pats Peter on the back and walks off with a laugh. Go and mingle. Maybe find a wandering supermodel to occupy your time? We'll meet up later. Some nearby finely dressed women heard what Tony said and gave Peter a look. He was just joking. I'm in a relationship, bye. Peter runs off before he could feel the awkwardness in the air. Walking around a bit, Peter was greeted by random men and women, who seemed to be important people from either Stark Industries or other companies. Walking up to the bar, Peter could see a man in a familiar black suit talking to Tony, who was barely paying attention to the conversation. Let's just put something on the books. Tony says as he stares off into the crowd. How about the 24th at 7pm at Stark Industries headquarters? Agent Cowlson asks. Tell you what. You got it. You're absolutely right. Well, I'm going to go to my assistant, and we'll make a date. Tony walks off in Pepper's direction. Peter finally understood why Tony was so distracted. His lower head was doing the thinking at the moment. Pepper was dressed in a beautiful backless dress and he couldn't keep his eyes off of her. If only her actress, Gwyneth Paltrow, from Peter's last life wasn't such a nut job scammer, who sells vagina scented candles and vagina eggs that were marketed to enhance orgasms and improve bladder control. Hello, again. Peter takes Tony's place next to Cowlson at the bar. Spider-Man. I didn't expect you to be here. Cowlson greets Peter with a surprised smile. Yeah, Tony and I are best buds now. Peter says as they watch the man himself dance with his assistant. How are things with Natasha? Cowlson asks. We're fine. I've been too busy helping Tony with something to train with her lately though. Peter answers. I see. Cowlson knew he was mad at her for the satellite scheme Fury came up with. She didn't lie, you know. A second-hand lie is still a lie. She's an expert in these things, so I'm sure she had her doubts. If Natasha wants to apologize and explain herself, then she can come to me and do so herself. 
Peter says as Tony walks back to the bar, were things getting too hot and heavy over there? Peter comments, changing the subject. You have no idea. Tony mutters as he orders a drink from the bartender. While Tony was waiting for the drink, a woman comes up and speaks to him. At first, the conversation is slightly flirty, but soon it turns serious as the woman pulls out a picture, accusing Tony of some atrocity. When was this taken? Tony asks in shock. The pictures show the deaths of innocent civilians in a desert town, alongside tons of Stark Industries weaponry. These pictures were taken one day ago. It's a town called Golmara. Ever heard of it? She asks accusingly. I didn't approve any shipment. Tony denies. Well, your company did. After seeing these pictures, Carlson and Peter watch Tony storm over to Obadiah's Dana and have a tense-looking conversation that ended in a picture together. Let's take a picture. Come on. Picture time. Stana puts his arm around Tony's shoulder. Tony, who do you think locked you out of the company? I was the one who filed the injunction against you. It was the only way I could protect you. He says condescendingly and walks off, leaving a shocked Tony Stark behind. Walking up to Tony, Peter goes to speak, but Tony stops him. Don't say it. Tony says in dread. I told you so. Peter says it anyway. I have some work to do. Tony sighs and storms off to his car. As Tony closed the driver's side door and started the car, Peter hops in as well. We have some work to do. Peter says reassuringly. Tony smiles for a moment and then peels off down the road, heading straight home. As they arrive at Tony's mansion, the news was still on, but this time it wasn't covering the Stark charity event. Simple farmers and herders from peaceful villages have been driven from their homes. Victims have been forced to take shelter in whatever crude dwellings they can find in the ruins of other villages. As you can see, these men, known as the Ten Rings, are heavily armed and on a mission that could prove fatal to anyone who stands in their way. There's very little hope for these refugees, refugees who can only wonder who, if anyone, will help. Jarvis, how long until my suit is finished? Tony asks. Two hours and seventeen minutes, sir. Jarvis answers. Sighing in annoyance, Tony could do nothing but watch the carnage on the news. Maybe I should go over there ahead of you. Peter says as he sees bombs raining into civilian areas on the TV. I won't attack them or reveal myself until you get there. I know you want to be the one to do that. How are you going to help then? Tony asks. I have a few tricks up my sleeve that you've never seen before. Peter says as his suit goes into dark mode. I'll be waiting for you. Peter says as he opens a portal, causing desert sands to blow into the room as he walks through, leaving Tony behind. As the portal closes, Tony contemplated following Peter through but knew he was no help without his iron suit. Sigh. Tony hated waiting but it was all he could do. Arriving at the edge of the bombsite, Peter took cover out of sight behind a nearby crumbling building. He could sense the people that were hiding in and around the decimated village. All right, let's test some large area protection enchantments. Peter thought as he cast an illusion over himself, changing his appearance to match one of the many civilians in the area, before turning his attention to the bombed village itself. I've never done this before, but there's no time like the present to see if I can get it done. A slash n, 1491 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll remain number one which is great. Here's a picture of a cow cow. Wow, so cool. Now give me stones pls. Chapter 36, C36 official team up. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 16 chapters ahead at chapter 52. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. After disguising himself with an illusion, Peter assumed a stance with his arms wide open. Instantly, large-scale spell circles appeared and draw themselves into the air. If not for the constant bombardment of Stark Industry missiles, which caused smoke and fire to cover the village, someone would have easily noticed the spell circles. After fully forming, the spell circles descend onto the village and expand to cover every house and building in the area. Soon, the spell circles fade into a sort of brand, marking every wall, roof, and door in the village. That should hold long enough for me to evacuate everyone. Peter mutters as a missive hits a half-broken house. Boom. As the smoke clears, the house is still standing as if nothing happened. Though the brand that was left on the home fades slightly. That house would be able to take three or four more explosions before the protection disappeared. I'm quite impressed with myself. Peter thought as he watched his spell work perfectly. This spell is a more powerful but less hidden version of the shielding spell he placed on his loved ones. He just cranked it up a notch and placed it on a large area, allowing each building's shield to take a certain amount of damage before it wore off. Rushing into the village, Peter dodged missiles and mortars as he escorted the leftover civilians out of the village. Peter would rush to them using his enhanced senses, and put them to sleep with a simple spell. Once they were out cold, he would portal them to a nearby refugee camp and move on to the next house. By the time the village was empty, the protection Peter put in place was broken. Within minutes after that, the entire village was broken. Most of the buildings were demolished. Everything else was nothing but rubble and smoke. When the bombardment stopped, the Ten Rings, who were stationed on the outskirts, where they fired their weapons from, drove into the village and admired their work. After searching the place for survivors, the terrorists found none and set up camp, turning the once peaceful village into a sort of home base. 
They unloaded Stark weaponry from their trucks as they made themselves at home in the remaining homes of innocent people they either killed or drove away. The terrorists seemed annoyed and confused at the lack of remaining civilians, probably wanting to take them hostage or recruit those able to their cause. Seeing that the Ten Rings are taking a break from their onslaught, Peter portaled back into Stark's mansion. As the portal closes behind him, the illusion he disguised himself with disappears. Yo. Peter calls out. Jarvis, where is Tony? Mr. Stark is in the workshop. His suit is finished. Jarvis says as Peter walks downstairs to the workshop. Tony's workshop has a passcode to enter, but due to Peter's constant assistance over the past week, he was given his own code to enter. It would only work when Tony was in the workshop. He can always portal inside if needed as well. Though Tony made him promise not to do so unless there's an emergency. Walking down the stairs, Peter saw Tony standing with his arms in a T-pose as machines attached red and gold armor onto his body. Looking good. Peter called out as Tony donned the helmet, completing his Iron Man armor. Are you ready to head out? I know the exact location and already evacuated the would-be hostages. Looking down at his hands and seeing the blasters on his palms pull slightly, Tony looks up at Peter as the face mask on his suit closes. Let's do this. A morphed metallic voice rings out from the suit. Switching his suit back to the red and blue design, Peter opens a portal and Tony launches himself forward, flying straight through without a word. Normally, Peter would use his dark suit to hide his actions, but he's already been seen with Tony Stark in public. Tony will announce that he's Iron Man soon enough, so hiding would actually work against him in this case. People may draw a connection between Spider-Man and his darker disguise, which wouldn't be good. By the time Peter stepped through the portal, gunfire, and the sound of Tony's hand blasters were going off inside the broken village. Rushing to Tony's location, Peter saw Iron Man shooting lasers from his hand and launching terrorists across the village with simple punches. Looking behind Tony, Peter saw a tank in the distance, aiming at Tony's exposed back. As the tank fired and a giant shell launched from its barrel toward the back of his friend, Peter dashed forward and shot a web at the giant bullet. As the web connected with its target, Peter jumped in the air, pulling the large piece of metal with him. Yanking the web over his head, he sends the rocket crashing down onto the beefy metal tank. Bang! The tank caves in slightly as the shell embedded itself into it, causing the tank to explode soon after. Boom! Thanks, buddy! Tony's metallic voice calls out as Peter turns to see Iron Man blast a guy into a crumbling wall. No prob. Peter yells back as he jumps into the air and shoots countless webs, which attach themselves to the assault rifles of multiple terrorists. Pulling on the multiple webs, many guns come flying in Peter's direction. Grabbing two AK-47s from the air, Peter holds them akimbo style and unloads on the now unarmed members of the Ten Rings. Tony follows his lead and launches into the air as well, using his HUD to lock onto the many terrorists in the village, small guns rise from his shoulders and fire. Each shot landed as a perfect headshot, giving these unscrupulous men a quick death, which maybe they didn't deserve. As the gunfire from both Peter's AK-47s and Tony's suit died down, everyone was dead and all that remained were corpses and the many crates filled with Stark Industries weaponry. Peter looked at the corpses surrounding him and felt nothing. He thought that killing would give him this horrible feeling, as all forms of media told him so, yet that feeling never came. Is there something wrong with me? He thought as Tony starts blowing up the many crates filled with his company's goods. Walking out of the village to get some distance from the explosions, Peter could see some military Humvees driving through the sands and in their direction. They must have seen what happened and decided to finally move in. Peter thought as Tony flew off into the clouds. Did this idiot forget I can portal us home? Shaking his head, Peter opens a portal and returns to Tony's house, ordering some Chinese food with Tony's money while he waits. As many black SUVs pulled into a dark camp filled with tents and armed men located in the Afghan desert, a bald-bearded man steps out alongside multiple armed security forces. Welcome. Rasa, who is the leader of the Ten Rings in this area of the world, welcomes Obadiah Stana, who stares at the man's burned head. If you'd killed Tony when you were supposed to, you'd still have a face. Stana comments. You paid us trinkets to kill a prince. Rasa responds with anger and annoyance clear in his voice. Show me the weapon. Stana ignores what he said. Come. Leave your guards outside. Rasa leads Stana to the inside of a tent at the heart of the camp. His escape bore unexpected fruit. Obadiah lays his eyes on the Mark I Iron Man suit. It looked worn from the battle during Tony's escape, but with the right power source and some elbow grease, it could function once again. So this is how he did it. Stan S says as he admires the armor. This is only a first, crude effort. Stark has perfected his design. He has made a masterpiece of death. A man with a dozen of these can rule all of Asia. Gaza says with a hopeful smile. You dream of Stark's throne. We have a common enemy. If we are still in business, I will give you these designs, as a gift. In turn, I hope you'll repay me with a gift of iron soldiers. Technology. Stan e places his hand on Rasa's shoulder and uses a small handheld machine to stun Rasa. It's always been your Achilles heel in this part of the world. Don't worry. It'll only last for 15 minutes. Though that's the least of your problems. Stan e walks out of the tent and finds his security forces waiting for him. All of Rasa's men have been disarmed and we're on their knees with their hands on their heads. All right, let's finish up here. Crate up the armor and the rest of it. Stan e orders as he ignores everything and gets back into one of the many SUVs. 
As he closes the door to the SUV and takes out his phone to make a call, the sound of gunfire fills the air as Stanez men execute the captive terrorists. Set up Sector 16 underneath the arcade reactor, and I'm going to want this data masked. Recruit our top engineers. I want a prototype right away. A slash N, 1508 words. Don't forget my stones. I must remain number one forever. Until the end of time this story must remain glued to the top of the list. Never to fall below first place. Insert fireworks and inspirational music here. Chapter 37, C37 Full Truth. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 16 chapters ahead at Chapter 53. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. Tony didn't return home quickly enough, so Peter took his Chinese food and returned home. While he was eating his food in the living room, Peter saw Tony's military friend, James Rhodes, appear on the news talking about some sort of training exercise. Did that idiot run into a US fighter jet, like in the movie? Peter guessed. After he finished eating, Peter cleaned up and portaled back to Tony's house, where he found Tony and Pepper having some sort of argument. Well, then, I quit. Pepper tosses a flash drive onto a nearby desk. You stood by my side all these years while I reaped the benefits of destruction, and now that I'm trying to protect the people that I put in harm's way, you're going to walk out. Tony asks in confusion. You're going to kill yourself, Tony. I'm not going to be a part of it. Pepper answers back in exasperation. I shouldn't be alive unless it was for a reason. I'm not crazy, Pepper. I just finally know what I have to do, and I know in my heart that it's right. Tony explains. Pepper reluctantly picks up the flash drive from the desk, and lets out a resigned sigh. You're all I have, too, you know. Pepper says and goes to leave but Peter was in her way. Yo. Peter says with a wave. What are you two up to? I'm going to infiltrate Tony's office to get proof of Obadiah's crimes. Pepper says, holding up the flash drive. Nah, you don't have to do that. Peter says as he snatches the drive from her hand. I'll be right back. Technically, Peter already knows everything they'll find in this little excursion. Though having the proof in hand would make it easier for Tony to explain to the authorities. Before either of them could say anything, Peter activates the anti-camera function of his suit, turns it black, and portals to the rooftop of Stark Industries headquarters. Walking down the side of the building, Peter found Tony's office. Using a simple spell to face through the window, Peter sits at the desk and plugs the flash drive into the PC's USB port. Instantly, the screen lights up as a red window pops up. Warning, security breach. Soon after, some code appears on the screen and the warning disappears. Access granted? While the flash drive did its work, Peter cast a quick locking spell on the door. In the movie, Stana almost catches Pepper doing this. He does, however, find out that she stole the information afterwards. That probably won't happen this time, unless Tony was sloppy with this flash drive and someone learns of the security breach, which is very unlikely. Peter didn't care either way. Taking out Ironmonger would be easy. The only reason that Peter is letting things sort of play out is that Tony needs to become the hero he's meant to be. If Peter were to take care of everything before it happens, Tony may not become Iron Man, which would be a huge disservice to the world. While Peter was waiting for the flash drive to finish stealing the information on Stana's crimes and plans, the door's handle jiggled. Someone tried to open the door but it didn't budge thanks to Peter's spell. Knock knock. Hello, who's in there? Peter heard Stana's voice ask from the other side of the door. Housekeeping. Peter answered in a fake high-pitched voice. Contact security? There's an intruder in Tony's office. Obadiah yells from the other side of the door. Smirking at the situation, Peter waits patiently for the flash drive to finish. Meanwhile, he could hear constant banging as the security guards arrived and tried their best to kick the door open. Sadly for them, the spell Peter placed on the door was keeping it locked and unbreakable. At least, to normal humans. By the time the download was finished, the security team brought a small explosive to blow the door open. This is the headquarters of a weapons manufacturer's company after all. Boom, the door was blown open and a group of heavily armed security forces rushed in the room like a trained group of Navy SEALs. Walking behind them was Obadiah, who entered the room without a care in the world. On the ground now. Hands where I can see them. They yelled and swiftly cleared the room, finding nobody but themselves inside. Walking over to the computer, Stan M moved the mouse, causing the screen to light up. Download complete. F asterisk CK. Obadiah yells as he turns to the security. Lock down the building. I want this person found and brought to me. A portal opens in Tony's house as Peter steps out, finding Tony and Pepper drinking wine on the couch. They seemed very close for a boss and his assistant. I feel like I just walked into the start of a porno. Peter comments, causing the two to instantly slide away from one another. It's not like that. Pepper seemed embarrassed. Did it go well? Tony ignores the situation and changes the subject. Yup, here you go. Peter says and tosses the flash drive to Tony. All three of them moved to the workshop, where Tony plugged the flash drive in and saw the plethora of proof, showing the many crimes and betrayals that the Stark family friend, Obadiah Stana has committed. A video showing Rasa, who is now deceased, speaking to Stana plays. You did not tell us that the target you paid us to kill was the great Tony Stark. As you can see, Obadiah Stana. Oh, my god. Pepper mutters in shock. Your deception and lies will cost you dearly. 
The price to kill Tony Stark has just gone up. As the video ends, Tony stood rooted in silence as he stared at the screen with a sad and hurt look on his face. Obadiah was practically an uncle to him growing up, so this turn of events was truly shocking. The man may have locked him out of his company and sold guns off the books, but Tony didn't expect the guy to be the one behind his kidnapping. Well, technically he wanted Tony dead. Tony are you okay? Pepper asks as she places a comforting hand on his shoulder. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm good. Tony mutters as he looks at the rest of the evidence. Sector 16. It looks like that's where he's building his own version of your suit. Peter comments as he sees the blueprints for Tony's first suit alongside new blueprints for the Ironmonger armor. He doesn't have a power source, so he's planning to use my dad's giant arc reactor. Tony mutters as he sees that Sector 16 is underneath the giant arc reactor that powers Stark Industry headquarters. You should be careful, Tony. I wouldn't put it past him to try and steal your mini arc reactor. He seems like the kind of guy to snatch it right out of your chest. Peter comments, knowing that Stan Ed did that in the movie. I'm sure he will want his suit to be wireless sooner rather than later. Hearing what Peter said, Pepper suddenly had a bad premonition. Oh, she muttered. What is it? Tony asked. I didn't destroy your first reactor, she says, talking about the one Tony told her to incinerate. It's in my office. What? Why? Tony asks incredulously. I was going to get it put in a display case and give it to you as a gift, but I never got around to it. Pepper explains as she smacks her hand onto her forehead. Do you think Stana would find it? What do we have here? Obadiah comments as a security officer brings him a small palm-sized arc reactor. We searched the building for the intruder, but found nobody out of place. The officer says as he gestures to Tony's first act reactor. That was found in Ms. Potts' office. Hmm, thank you, Pepper. Let's just assume that he has it. Peter says with a shrug. It's not that big of a deal either way. With me and Tony's combined strength, we can take care of this easily. You're right, let's head out and catch this son of a b asterisk tch. Tony says as he walks over to his armor, which still had a few bullet holes in it. Jarvis, when will my suit be ready? It will be ready in half an hour, sir. Jarvis responded as the machines in the room began working in the armor. Good, we'll be upstairs. Notify me when it's done. As the three of them walk upstairs, the doorbell rings, and a video of the front door appears on the TV, showing Agent Cowlson waiting patiently. This guy can't take a hint, can he? Tony mutters as he ignores the doorbell. Poor Cowlson. Peter thought as he walked to the door and opened it. Tony wanted to stop him but the door was opened before he could speak or move. Mr. Sta. Cowlson starts but sees someone he didn't expect. Spider-Man, you weren't kidding when you said Tony was your friend, huh? No, come inside, we have a lot to discuss. A slash n, 1549 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll remain king of fanfictions. Forever on my throne of power and stones. Yes, he he ha 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 ha. Chapter 38, C38 Ironmonger. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 16 chapters ahead at chapter 54. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. Webhead, is there a reason why you let a government agent into my home? Tony asks as Peter and Cowlson walk into the living room. I know Cowlson. Peter says with a shrug. Hello to you too, Mr. Stark. Cowlson says with an exasperated smile. You missed our meeting at your company. You know, it was quite weird. While I was waiting in the lobby, the whole place went into lockdown. Hearing this, both Tony and Pepper look towards Peter, who scratched the back of his head, nervously. I may have pretended to be housekeeping while stealing the information you wanted. No one saw me though. Peter says, causing Tony and Pepper to sigh and roll their eyes at him. Stealing information. Cowlson asks from the side. See what you've done. Tony says to Peter as he points at Cowlson. Now the government is involved. SHIELD is an extra government agency. We work beyond the province, powers, or proper sphere of any government. Cowlson explains. What happened to the long-winded name? Strategic Homeland Intervention and whatever other nonsense. Tony asks mockingly. We decided to abbreviate. Cowlson answers simply. I've worked with SHIELD here and there. They aren't too bad. I wouldn't trust them, but they usually try to help. At least from what I've seen so far. Peter explains, causing Cowlson to look at him. You still don't trust us. He asks in exasperation. I trust Natasha a little bit and you even less, but other than that, the rest of you are strangers to me. I tend not to put my trust in government agencies, especially the ones with no accountability, as you just so eloquently explained to Tony only moments ago. Peter responds with a shrug. Who's Natasha? Is that your girlfriend? Tony asks, knowing Peter is in a relationship from their many sleepless nights spent together working on his Iron Man suit. No, she's a friend, who teaches me martial arts. She works for S.H.I.E.L.D. Peter clarifies and swiftly changes the subject. Jarvis, can you make a copy of all incriminating evidence pertaining to Obadiah Stana for our extra government friend here? I'm afraid that I'll need Mr. Stark's permission for that. Jarvis answers through the speakers of the house. You just said we shouldn't trust S.H.I.E.L.D., so why should we give them anything? Tony asks. That doesn't mean they can't make themselves useful. We can go and stop Stanette, as he probably has his armor finished by now. Once we've captured him, Coulson here can clean up after us. Peter pats Phil on the shoulder. 
Trust me, as a superhero you don't want to do the cleanup. That's the boring part, which is better left to people like Cowlson. Fine, Jarvis give him only the evidence, no blueprints, or any other sensitive information. Tony agrees. How did I get relegated to the maid? Cowlson asked with a sigh. It's either that or you aren't involved at all. Peter shrugs. Cowlson could do nothing but agree as Tony brought him a flash drive filled with evidence against Stana. While Phil was going over the evidence, Jarvis spoke through the speakers. Mr. Stark, your suit is fully prepared. As the sun set outside Stark Industries headquarters, a portal opened on the rooftop, and out walked Peter and Tony, dressed in their respective superhero suits. Before the portal could even close, Peter heard the sound of guns cocking behind him. Acting quickly, Peter backflipped and appeared over the heads of four armed guards. Shooting a web at two of them, Peter grabs the other end and pulls, swinging the two guards off of their feet and slamming them onto the concrete rooftop. Asterisk bam, bam, asterisk. It seems they upped the security since my last visit. Peter mutters as Tony flies over and smashes the other two guards into the ground with his robot hands. Obi probably knows we're here. Tony comments as the four guards nap quietly on the ground. You lead the way. I don't know where I'm going in this place. Peter gestures for Tony to take the lead. All right, keep up. Tony says as he soars into the air and shoots down into the building, creating his own entrances along the way. You'd think he would care more about his own building. Peter mutters as he jumps through the holes left by Tony. When he got through the very last hole, Peter found Tony walking around a dark engineer's workshop, with wires, tools, and computer monitors everywhere. Hey, look it's your first suit. Peter calls out. Tony turns to see his Mark I suit, standing with a bunch of wires and other instruments attached to it. They must have used it as a reference to make this. Tony says as he points at a nearby monitor, which showed the blueprint of the Ironmonger armor. But where's that? Peter asks as he turns to see eyes light up in a nearby dark corner. Found it. Stomp stomp stomp. Heavy metallic steps are heard as a huge Hulk-like figure steps into the light. The figure of Ironmonger towers over Peter and Tony. Insert picture of MCU Ironmonger here. Tony. Obadiah's metallic voice echoes from inside the giant suit of power armor. I see you brought Spider-Man as well. No matter, neither of you will survive the night. Ironmonger rushes forward and tries to grab Peter and Tony in each hand. Tony uses his hand thrusters to burst himself backward, while Peter simply hopped onto Ironmonger's head, kicking off into the ceiling. Come down, big guy. You're destroying company property. Peter comments as he shoots some webs around Ironmonger's legs, causing Stanette to trip as he ran after Tony. Bang. The floor caves in as the titanic figure of Ironmonger smashes onto the ground. You annoying bug. Stanne exclaims as he spreads his legs, easily breaking the webs. Spiders aren't bugs. Peter corrects as he shoots off the ceiling and stumps on Ironmonger's metal head. They're arachnids. Tag out. Tony yelled as he charges up his hand blasters, pointing them at Peter and Stanne. Listening to Tony, Peter kicked off Stanne's head and got out of the way. As Ironmonger got back to his feet, Tony was there waiting and blasted his palm thrusters at full power. When the blast made contact with Ironmonger's metal shell, Stanne was sent flying up into the ceiling, breaking floors, walls, and ceilings on his way outside of the building and into the parking lot. Landing on a row of cars and crushing them completely, their alarms blare as Ironmonger uses a nearby Prius to prop himself up and get back to his feet, flattening it in the process. I love this suit. Stanne yells as he brushes car parts from his metal body. All that damage and I'm perfectly fine. Grabbing a car in each hand, Ironmonger launches them at Peter and Tony, as they follow the trail of carnage leading to the parking lot. Peter easily dodged his car as he has spider senses, but Tony was hit directly and launched back into the building. For 30 years, I've been holding you up. I built this company from nothing. Nothing is going to stand in my way. Least of all, you and some insect. Stanne yells angrily as multiple rockets appear on his shoulders. Instantly, he shoots two rockets each toward Peter and Tony, who just came flying out of the building with a headlight hanging off his arm. Peter relies on his spider senses to dodge while redirecting his two rockets back at Ironmonger with his webs. Tony, on the other hand, used his HUD to lock on to his two rockets and shot them with guns that extended out of his shoulders. Boom boom. As Peter's rockets came crashing down on Ironmonger, Peter and Tony waited for the smoke to clear and found that Stan's suit only took some minor damage, losing only a couple of metal plates on his arms, which he used to block the impacts and explosions. Tony began to hover in the air, wanting to use his flight advantage against Stan A, though it didn't go the way he wanted. Impressive. You've upgraded your armor. I've made some upgrades of my own as well. Stan A says as he launches off the ground with similar hands and feet thrusters to Tony's suit. Knowing that Tony will take it from here, Peter steps aside as he watches Iron Man lead Iron Munger further and further into the sky. Peter could have ended this fight the moment he saw the Iron Munger suit in the Sector 16 workshop, but Tony needs to be the one to win, not Peter. After waiting a while, the two figures disappeared high into the clouds, but soon enough, one of them comes crashing down. An iced over Iron Munger comes crashing back into the parking lot in front of Peter, who knew this would happan. Tony fixed the ice problem with his suit already, but Stan Ed didn't even know about that the problem existed. Walking over to the downed and icy figure of Stanez armor, Peter dug his hand into its chest and yanked out the Mark I arc reactor, cutting any power that was going to the suit. 
Soon after, Tony landed next to Peter, and they both looked at the powerless Ironmonger, wondering if Stana was still alive. A slash N, Ironmonger is a fairly low tier villain so I didn't want to drag out his arc for too long. Peter could beat him in seconds and Tony wasn't at a disadvantage like in the movie as well. Hence the single chapter fight scene. A slash N, 1583 words. Don't forget my stones. Now that I've built my throne of power stones as the king of fanfics, we must move on toward the next plan of action. I need more stones to build my royal castle, where I will look down on all the peasants below. Yes, he he ha 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 ha. Chapter 39, C39 Avengers Initiative. Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 55. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. While staring at the powerless Iron Munger suit, which may or may not contain a living Obadiah Stana, black unmarked government type vehicles pulled into the parking lot. As they parked, agents in black suits unloaded from the cars and began to secure the area. They had good timing, as the streets outside Stark Industries were filling with witnesses. Most of them were recording on their phones and had been recording since the fight was taken to the parking lot. News vans were pulling up as well, with reporters and cameramen stepping out, ready to give live updates to their respective news channels. You made quite the mess. Carlson calls out as he walks over with Natasha following closely behind him. Well, that's why we have you, the shield maid service. Peter jokes as he leans his arm on Tony's shoulder. Hello, spy day. Natasha greets him for the first time since Peter met Tony. Hello. Peter responds curtly. You, I feel the drama in the air. Tony comments with a smirk. Are you sure she isn't your girlfriend? No, she just broke my trust and has yet to apologize. Peter says, looking at Natasha. Maybe you two should have this conversation at a later date. Carlson interrupts as he points over at the downed iron munger suit. Is Mr. Stanay in that? Yes, we took the power source out as well. Peter holds up the glowing arc reactor in his hand. We're just not sure if he's alive or not. Well, let's not check here with all of the cameras nearby, Natasha says as she gestures to the huge hole in the side of the building. Drag him inside and crack it open. If he's alive, we'll take him into custody. What if he's dead? Tony asks sadly as the man was very close to him and his deceased family. No matter what happened, those feelings don't just go away in a single night. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You've all received the official statement of what occurred at Stark Industries last night. There have been unconfirmed reports that a robotic prototype malfunctioned and caused damage to the building. Fortunately, a member of Tony Stark's personal security staff, James Rhodes, Tony's military friend, spoke at a press conference in Stark Industries, where Tony held his upon his return to LA after his kidnapping. In the very same building, Tony sat in his office, reading a newspaper with the front page headline titled, Who is the Iron Man? Iron Man. Tony reads the front page as he turns to Peter, who's in his spider suit, seated at Tony's desk with his feet up. That's kind of catchy. You were right, Webhead. The media did come up with a good name. It's got a nice ring to it. I mean, it's not technically accurate. The suit's a gold titanium alloy, but it's kind of evocative, you know. While Tony was reading the paper, Pepper was applying some minor makeup. Tony would be addressing the press after James Rhodes, so he wanted to look his best. Especially since he needed to cover up some bruises from last night's fight. Yeah, it's their job to pick compelling titles and names. Not everyone can be like me and choose their own name. Peter says jokingly. Here's your alibi, Mr. Stark. Carlson walks into the room and hands Tony a written speech for the press conference. Okay. Tony mutters as he puts down the newspaper and looks over what S.H.I.E.L.D. wrote for him. You were on your yacht. Carlson explains, getting a nod from Tony. We have poured papers that put you in Avalon all night, and sworn statements from 50 of your guests. See, I was thinking maybe we should say it was just Pepper and me alone on an island. Tony says suggestively as he gives Pepper a heated look. That's what happened. Carlson, points at the paper, not having any of Tony's bullsh asterisk t just read it, word for word. Nothing more. Nothing less. There's nothing about Stana here. Tony asks, sadness flashing on his face for only a moment. After getting the Iron Munger suit inside Stark Industries, Peter and Tony pried the thing open and found Stana dead inside. The impact from his icy fall caused the suit to cave in onto his chest, crushing his lungs. Stana pretty much died from internal bleeding and suffocation, which probably wasn't a quick and painless death. That's being handled. He's on vacation. Small aircrafts have such a poor safety record. Carlson says insinuatingly, which causes Tony to ask more questions. This isn't my first rodeo, Mr. Stark. Just stick to the official statement, and soon enough, this will all be behind you. As Pepper finishes Tony's makeup, the two start flirting with one another. While they were off in their own world, Natasha walks in and strolls right up to Peter. I'm sorry. She says immediately. I technically didn't lie to you, since I was told the satellite was out of range, but I knew that didn't sound right. It may be my job to do these sorts of things, but we're, friends. I should have said something and I'm sorry. Apology accepted? Peter says, shocking Natasha who thought he wouldn't forgive her so easily. Surprised? I knew the whole satellite thing was fishy the second I heard it. Besides, S.H.I.E.L.D. knowing about my portal-making ability isn't that big of a deal. Thank you, it won't happen again. 
Natasha says genuinely but Peter holds up his hand, stopping her. That's the second time I've heard those words from you. Peter says, pertaining to their first meeting. Make it the last, please. Peter's words rang out in Natasha's mind as she swore to herself to not ruin this friendship. She doesn't have many friends and the feeling of betraying them is much worse compared to your average oligarch or enemy spy. Peter wouldn't trust her just yet, as she would have to prove herself, but hopefully, she can become someone he can rely on and trust more in the future. When the time finally arrived, Tony went up on stage, taking the podium in front of countless reporters and news cameras, which were covering this whole thing live on every news channel. Peter was hidden off stage with Carlson, Rhodes, Pepper, and Natasha, watching from the sidelines. It has been a while since I was in front of you. I figure I'll stick to the script this time. There's been speculation that I was involved in the events that occurred at Stark Industries. Tony starts reading the pre-written speech, but a reporter interrupts him. I'm sorry, Mr. Stark, but do you honestly expect us to believe that last night's incident was a bodyguard in a suit that conveniently appeared, even though your friend, Spider-Man, was fighting alongside? The reporter voices everyone's doubts but was interrupted as well. I know that it's confusing. It's one thing to question the official story, and another entirely to make wild accusations, or insinuate that I'm a superhero. Tony says with a smirk as he says superhero. I never said you were a superhero. The reporter replies. You didn't? Well, good, because that would be outlandish and fantastic. I'm just not the hero type. Clearly, with this laundry list of character defects, all the mistakes I've made, largely public. Just stick to the cards. Cowlson mutters with a sigh. I don't think that's Tony's style. Peter comments as he waits for the moment to happen. The truth is, I am Iron Man. Tony throws the pre-written speech over his shoulder as the room fills with questions from the reporters. Peter walks out on stage and puts his arm around Tony's shoulder. I am Spider-Man too. Peter says as he throws up a peace sign at the many cameras. Did you have to ruin my moment, webhead? Tony mutters, but there's a microphone in front of them so everyone watching heard him. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Peter laughs awkwardly. This moment was one of the coolest in the first Iron Man movie. Instead of hiding his identity like Peter, Tony just outs himself on live television. As Peter and Tony left the stage, the world welcomed the entrance of its second superhero. Well, the second living superhero. Although Captain America is technically alive, he's still frozen in ice somewhere. Do you understand the massive SH asterisk T storm you just brought to your front door? Cowlson asks, annoyed that the speech and alibi he spent hours sleeplessly crafting were disregarded. Sorry, it just wasn't my style. Tony says as he walks past Cowlson. I told you so. Peter says with a laugh as he follows after Tony. Jarvis. Tony calls out as he and Peter walk through a portal and into his mansion. Welcome home. Jarvis speaks in a distorted voice which soon cuts out. I am Iron Man. A familiar voice fills the room. Do you two idiots really think that you're the only superheroes in the world? Who the hell are you? Tony asks with his guard up. Is that you, angry boss man? Peter asks, knowing that it's Fury. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The voice says as Fury steps out of a dark corner, revealing himself and sending a nod in greeting towards Peter. Spider-Man. Ah. Uh, Tony grunts nonchalantly. I'm here to talk to you two about the Avengers initiative. Fury reveals as he holds up a folder. A slash N, 1592 words. Don't forget my stones. And I'll do nothing because I'm lazy. Though I'm still king, so bow before me. Person bowing female sign person bowing. Chapter 40, C40 Aliens? Want to read ahead of what I've posted so far? Go to my Patreon and get early access chapters. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 15 chapters ahead at chapter 55. I'll be writing one or two more chapters today. Get on Discord. I'm here to talk to you too about the Avengers Initiative. Fury, who just broken into Tony's mansion, reveals as he holds up a folder. Oh, do I finally get to know what the Avengers thing is all about? Peter exclaimed as he rushed over to Fury and snatched the folder. Hey. Fury shouted, trying to take the folder back, but Peter already made his way back across the room. What's this all about? Tony mutters as he pours himself a drink and takes a seat next to Peter, who was flipping through the many pages in the file Fury brought. I know just about as much as you. I've only heard of this Avengers thing because the angry Cyclops over there let it slip when we first met. Peter explains as Tony reads over his shoulder. The Avengers Initiative is a program created to bring together a group of remarkable people to face extraordinary threats. Fury explains as he takes a seat across from Peter and Tony. The Avengers Initiative, which was originally conceptualized as the Protector Initiative or Phase 1, is a project created by S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury to form the Avengers. A response team comprised of the most remarkable individuals humankind has to offer. The Avengers Initiative is supposed to defend the Earth from imminent global threats that are beyond the war-fighting capability of conventional military forces. Fury continues. What could you possibly be expecting to happen? Tony asks incredulously. This seems like you're preparing for some alien invasion or something says the man who just fought a villain in a giant metal suit of power armor. Just saying that makes me think we live in some type of comic book world. Fury comments with an annoyed look. The universe we live in is a lot more complicated than you would like to believe. One instance doesn't prove that we need to form some team of superheroes to handle non-existent threats. Tony explains as he takes the folder from Peter's hands and tosses it toward Fury. Hey, I was reading that. 
Peter snaps in annoyance. What? Don't tell me that you're buying this bullsh asterisk tea. Tony asks incredulously. This is obviously just a scheme to get any powerful people to be under the government in some way. Before Peter could reply, Fury took out another folder from his black trench coat. I knew you would be doubtful, so I brought the report of something that happened in 1995. Fury says as he hands over the folder. He wouldn't. Peter thought as he took the folder. Opening it up, Peter began reading through the heavily redacted sheets of paper. He was surprised to find it filled with information on the events that took place in the Captain Marvel movie. Carol Danvers' name seemed to be redacted alongside many other things, but it pretty much depicted the small invasion of two alien races. The Kree and the Skrull. The Kree are a militaristic race of mostly blue-skinned humanoids from the planet Hala. One of the most technically advanced races in the galaxy, the Kree are skilled in genetic engineering and are responsible for the creation of the Inhumans on Earth. Though that wasn't mentioned in the file. Politically, they are a powerful intergalactic state, controlling a vast fascist empire. Meanwhile, the Skrulls are a technologically advanced race of reptilian humanoids, native to the destroyed planet Skrulls. They are notable for their shape-shifting abilities, which allow them to replicate other life forms seamlessly, and infiltrate planets without suspicion. These two races are in a constant state of war, where the Kree military is hunting down any living Skrull refugees they could find. The conflict is completely one-sided, with the Skrulls being the victims of the Kree's genocidal war. No information about the Skrull's shape-shifting ability was mentioned in the file, which means it was most likely redacted. If Peter remembers correctly, some of the Skrulls stayed on Earth, with many of them joining S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury probably wants to keep their ability a secret, as someone who can shapeshift probably makes the perfect spy. Just look at Mystique from the X-Men. Another thing that seemed to be heavily redacted, or most likely not included in the report was the involvement of the Tesseract, but Peter expected that. Wow, aliens, huh? Peter comments as he looks at the many photos in the folder, which depicted some Skrull and Kree corpses alongside a spaceship and other proof. What? Tony exclaimed as he snatched the file from Peter's hand for the second time. Dude, if you keep doing that. Peter says menacingly. Oh, calm down, webhead. Tony shook his head as he started reading. After a minute of silence, Tony finished reading the file. Prove it. Tony says and tosses the file on the coffee table between them. How would you like me to do that, Mr. Stark? Fury asks with a smirk. He knew that with just this little bit of information that Tony and Spider-Man would at least take him seriously. After seeing proof of hostile advanced alien races, who wouldn't feel the need for precautions. These pictures show corpses. Tony says as he leans over and spreads the folder, showing the pictures. You had to have preserved them. Show me? Fine. After a moment of silent thought, Fury took out his phone and made a short phone call. Send the Quinjet to my location. After those short words, Fury hung up and looked toward Peter and Tony. Are we going to a secret shield lair? Peter asked. More like a shield facility, but yes. Fury nods. After only a few minutes of waiting, where Tony and Fury engaged in some sort of D asterisk CK measuring contest, Peter heard the sound of a jet engine over the mansion. As soon as he heard it, the engine sound disappeared and was replaced by the sound of a propeller going off. Looking out the window, they all saw the Quinjet land in Tony's spacious backyard. The fans on its wings allow the jet to maneuver like a helicopter. Insert picture of the Quinjet cuz why not? Come on. Fury calls out as he walks toward the jet. Tony looked hesitant, but Peter patted him on the back. Don't pee asterisk SSY out now. This was your idea after all. Peter says as he drags Tony to the jet. I'm not. I just don't trust this guy. Tony says. It's okay, if he tries anything then I'll save you. We all know you're useless without your suit after all. Peter says as he steps into the Quinjet, taking a seat across from Fury. Sighing reluctantly and annoyed by Peter's comment, Tony steps onto the jet and sits beside Peter. After a short and fast flight, the Quinjet flew low in a desert area and was headed straight at a rocky cliffside. Oh, is your secret lair on the side of that cliff? Peter says in awe as a portion of the cliffside opens up and the Quinjet flies inside. Eh, hey, I could do better. Tony mutters, clearly not as impressed as Peter. As a group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents come to welcome their arrival, the jet enters a huge hangar and lands beside some other aircraft. Good evening, Director. One of them says as he saluted. Can I be of any assistance? Take us to cold storage. Fury orders as the man motions for them to follow and leads the way. After going down a very long elevator, they arrived at their floor and the agents that accompanied them turned back. They didn't have the clearance level to enter this area. Following Fury down a hallway, he took them into a room, which was locked behind passcodes and key card access. Inside, Peter saw many big glass vats filled with cold blue liquid and the bodies of both Kree and Skrull corpses. Insert pictures of Skrull and Kree people here. Interesting. Peter mutters as he rushes over to a control terminal PC and starts typing. You won't be able to. Fury says as the lock screen on the PC is instantly bypassed. How did you do that? Shut up, he's working. Tony says as he walks over and watches Peter with an impressed look. Suddenly, a video of an autopsy of the bodies was played, showing the alien insides alongside commentary of the scientists working on the Kree and Skrull bodies. I would say I believe now. Peter comments as he passed the videos and turns to Tony. How about you? Same, I never thought we were alone in the universe, but this is just, crazy. 
Tony says as he walks up the glass vats and looks over the alien bodies. I'd like to perform my own tests on the bodies, but that can wait for another day. Do I have your cooperation for the Avengers initiative now? He asks with a smirk as if he already won them over. Sure. Tony says but Peter places a hand on his shoulder, stopping him. Don't give in so easily. Let's talk terms. Peter says, instantly wiping the smirk from Fury's smug face. I slash n, 1530 words. Don't forget my stones. Or I'll declare all of you rebels. As king of fanfictions, trust me. You don't want to learn the consequences of becoming a rebel.